Jonathan Ballou, um, one of the trainers of rookies, and have been dean for how long? No, no. <laughs> was it in the 90s? No. <laughs> we didn't like you here for the 90s. Yeah, we didn't like each other back then. No, no. Uh, still don't like him, really. Nah. No, um, <laughs> 2010, so this is, this. if you count the uh, uh, mandatory hiatus from the recent uh, closed borders and pandemic environments, the year 15, that I've been with the group. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. I love coming back. I'm only here for two weeks, and whenever I get here for two weeks, these guys work me to death, and we do presentations every night, so it's nice to give me a week before I have to do one. This is fantastic. Um, hey, um... Unfortunately, I won't get to see you with all of you this time, because I'm not here a long time. Uh, it's a very different course. But how many of you guys are in the rookies for the first time? Raise your hand. Excellent. The rest of you, I'm sorry you've heard this stuff before that I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Everyone else will be new for you, so this is great. Um, for those of you who have heard some of this stuff before, if you know me, I don't really prepare much. Um, I don't practice and make lots of mistakes, so uh, the information is always different because I generally so it'll be slightly different. But we're going to talk a little bit about learning, because that's what we're here to do, right? You guys are all here. Who's the snowboarder in this room? Excellent. There are some. Perfect. So I won't just say skiing. Perfect. Okay. You're here, assuming you're here for 6, 3, 8, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is, to get better at skiing and or riding, right? Okay. You have at your disposal here some of the absolute best trainers in the world, and deep. <laughs> <You're boss. laughs> you have at your disposal here some of the absolute best trainers in the world. I, I'll tell you, I, I came down here for two weeks this year, and I come down every year for two weeks to hang out with not just you guys, obviously, but to hang out with that crew of people. Josh, Harry, the whole house I'm living in. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> because you don't find this collection of uh, skiing and snowboarding brilliance uh, in one place really anywhere else. I've been here and I have a place called Interski that happens, a thing in event called Interski that happens every four years. So it's a really awesome place and you guys are here to, for the right reasons, obviously to learn, to get better, right? And you have the, all the resources at your disposal to get significantly better. The thing that's going to get in your way of getting better, guess what it is? Yeah, sorry, it's, <laughs> it's, it's gonna be your fault, right? And that's what we're gonna talk about. We're talking about how learning works today from a few different, from, from, from a few different perspectives. We're gonna talk about it from uh, a cognitive, psychological perspective, a little bit of an emotional perspective, not much though, that's a different lecture. And we're gonna talk about it primarily though, from a physical perspective, how we learn, and what gets in the way of it. So when you're done with this, you can go home, sleep on it, think that I've crushed your dreams or whatever, right? But you can think about it and come back tomorrow to get on snow with your, with your trainers with a different perspective, hopefully, on how you can remove some of the barriers to your own learning and maximize your time and financial investment in this place. All right? Let's take a look at this guy. Oh, that's a quick look at this mainly because I just want to watch really, really good skiing for a second. Sorry, I didn't, don't have any snowboarding on this, but this is the only snow sports we're going to watch. There's no technical stuff in this lecture, this presentation. This guy, skiing down the hill, looks totally effortless. It is pretty darn awesome. If you look at the clock, this is the second run. It's the World Cup from 2019. Um, He's sitting, he ends a second, just over a second, 1.4, 1.04, 1.1, ahead of the pack. This is Marcel Hersher. Six or seven time overall World Cup? Seven, right? Seven. Seven, 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 seven or no one ever seen. Right. No, no one else has ever done that before. Um, arguably, objectively the best year of his time, and arguably the best year ever. Right. This guy looks absolutely effortless on some of the most challenging, hardest, most difficult snow. This is steep, this is icy, this is all fall line. This makes, this makes first uh, 
first tracks on Main Street after a rainstorm <laughs> seem like a powder day. <laughs> With perfect drumming, by the way. This is the hardest conditions you can possibly imagine, and it changes from arc to arc. But what he's doing differently than everybody else is you look at him and it just doesn't look like he's working that hard. Some of the tech, what he understands, is not actually that different from what any of us understand. Why is it so easy for him to do this stuff, and so hard for us to figure it out? That's what we're going to get into. The reason is, <laughs> there we go. Um, the reason is, generally, because of what we understand and what we already know how to do. We're going to come back to that in a second. Ask me in the end, somebody ask me in the end, what's the difference between how he learned and how we learn right now? And we'll come back to that with the understanding in this presentation. All right? Let's start with this. This is a cognitive piece. We're not going to spend much time on it. The reason we're going to talk about this is because it's the basis for motor learning. Um, it's, uh, and understanding this model will not only help you in your exams, your own, if, you, if you have this coming up, they'll help you in your career, they'll help you learn. But if you want to understand the next piece, this is a great framework to work with. Who's heard of the concept of skill acquisition before? Okay, who's never heard of the concept of skill acquisition? Okay, skill acquisition is the process of learning, essentially. And what we're talking about here is acquiring a new skill. A skill is anything that can be learned or taught, right? So, and, and developed through practice. In this case, we're looking at motor skill, or how we move and do things with intention, how we action things. Every movement you have, speaking is a motor skill, uh, walking is a motor skill, balancing is a motor skill, using chopsticks or a fork is a motor skill, okay? Reaction to a hot iron that you touch, or a hot pan that you touch, that's a motor skill. Okay, Fitz and Posner, I have no idea what their first names are, but they wrote this stuff in 1967, first published. Um, I use this model because it, it hits a lot of the systems that we come from. Um, it's core to the NZ system, uh, both on the SBI NZ and the, uh, NZ, and the NZSI side of things. It's core to the PSI system, and it's core to Daisy, the British system. And it is the model that other systems are built on, such as uh, I think the Canadian system has what? Four, four, four stages? Uh, five, five stages, thank you. Five stages, another one that's got four, some other game. Anyway. Um, they're all they all derive from this, okay? Or another one that came out around the same time. But essentially, you have three stages that your brain goes through and your body goes through to create a, a good a, a, the ability to do absolutely anything. You could say absolutely no anything as well, which works too, but we're not talking about understanding, we're talking much more about physically doing. Okay, the cognitive stage. Um, I can memorize it, whatever. What it means is this. You start the cognitive stage not knowing what you don't know, and you end the cognitive stage knowing how to do something that you can't yet do. That's what that works. It's the process of forming a mental image of what success looks like but not the ability to do it, okay? Think about, you start off and you're making Z-shaped turns on whatever piece of equipment you're sliding down the hill on, and somebody says make round turns, and you go down the hill, and you keep making Z-turns, say, oh, those are pretty round. First saying, make round turns. No, I'm still making round turns. No, you're making Z-shaped turns, right? Z-shaped turns. And the process you're going through at this point with that trainer and in your mind is learning what a round turn actually looks like what it should look like. So that at some point he's like, holy shit, I'm not making round turns. I'm making Z-shaped turns. How the hell do I change this? Once we get to that point, you're no longer in the cognitive phase. The goal of this is to get out of it by saying, I know what success looks like, but I can't yet do it. You can also call that like, I'm consciously incompetent. I know exactly how bad I am. Okay, that's Tuesday, by the way. Most weeks when you train. Okay? <laughs> Tuesday morning, hopefully. If you're really good, it's some about 2.30 on Monday afternoon. Um, okay, the next stage is the associate stage. Okay, This is where a lot of the real work happens. This is where the real work that we're going to be talking about as far as the brain and the body go, come into play. But what this is, is in the associate stage, you're basically trial and erroring a lot of different things. You're experimenting a whole bunch of inputs, like 
what do I do with my body to make my equipment <coughs> do whatever it does, right? And trying to find a path to the, to, the, to the right outcome. And you go through and you try it, okay, that's wrong. Try it, that's wrong. Try it, oh, but that's right, I'm gonna keep that one. So you keep that and you keep adding pieces. It's really sloppy, it's messy. And the end of that really comes down to, I can do it if I'm thinking about it. I don't own it, but I can do it if I'm thinking about it. Like, I'm making round turns down Main Street until it gets steep. I go back to Street, right? I'm making round turns in the platter, but when I go on Main Street, it falls apart. But I practice it a few times and it starts to come together, but I have to be focusing on it. So if I stop fo focusing on it, all of a sudden I'm back to Zen Chain Turns. It's, that's, that's that phase, right? I can do it if I'm thinking about it. It's called associative because what you're doing is you're associating positive and negative results for what you're trying to do. And hopefully, if you're really conscious about it, you ditch the negative and you keep the positive and they become more owned. Eventually, what happens is you kind of have to start, you don't really think about it anymore and you're just doing it because it becomes this thing that you own and you can just do it, right? Like eating with, uh, um, with your, with your, with your, with your, with your right hand, with your right hand, right? Or if you grew up polite, I don't know, right? Um, an example of this would be, um, I was giving this presentation in, in China a few years ago, and um, it was over dinner, a version of this presentation, and I made everybody switch chopsticks to their left hand, <laughs> right? Oh, sure enough, by the end of the meal, which they had to do that the whole time, they could all do it. No, well, not everybody. But some of them could do it. They figured it out. But they sure as hell were not autonomous. They were still very associated. But they went through a process to figure it out. Okay? So, the last, last piece is autonomous. You own it. You can just do it. You don't have to think about it. In fact, it doesn't mean you're not using any brain power. It means you can think about other stuff instead of what you're doing. Like, you can think about where to go, how to do it, how fast to do it, how to change it. Think of, like, the first time... Has, ever, who, has anybody here never skied moguls or bumps before? Skied or ridden? Because you're all done for. Great. So, First thing you're doing is just trying to figure out how do I get around these things. And eventually you feel like, you go, oh, I got some rhythm and flow, I can kind of get down this stuff. When it becomes autonomous, you can be like, okay, where do I go? Where do I put my board or my skis? What's going to, is that, which is going to be the better place? What's going to be more fun? Which is going to give me more, more performance out of that piece of equipment? That's what happens in autonomous. So in the autonomous stage, what you're really talking about, using a Canadian word, Canadian phrase, you're talking about creative variation. That's the goal of the autonomous stage. Goal of the cognitive stage, how do you know you're in it? You know you're in it because either you have no idea what you're doing, or you know what you're trying to do and you can't do it. How do you know if you're in the associative phase? Because you know what to do and you can do it if you can, if you can, can concentrate on it really hard. How do you know if you're in the autonomous phase? Because you can do it all the time while focusing on other things, so you can be creative and vary. So the goal is mental picture, try to it, try to change it. Those are the things you're trying to do in those cases. Okay? There's a whole, we get way down that rabbit hole, but we're not gonna. That was about eight minutes, and that's about as much as we need on that. What we're gonna talk about now is what actually happens in your body physically when you go through these, these stages. When you're going through from, well, I don't know what I don't know, or let's even go with, uh, I know what to do, but I can't do it, to, I own it and I want to be creative with it. What is actually happening in the body? Because that's the most important thing. If you understand this piece, you know what you're going to psychologically go through, but you should know what your body's going to go through because it sets expectations appropriately for how long something should actually take. Okay, so these are uh, uh, actual x rays of two rookies from the bus on the way down last Friday. <laughs> they're, they're depressed. They're, this is, I think they're, they're comparing notes on their skiing, and it was very depressing. But, uh, no, uh, <laughs> if you notice what's, what's lit up here, right? It's two bodies, right? What's lit up here are really, he's got some joints and stuff, but really what's lit up is in the brain. This is where learning happens. Has anybody ever heard the term muscle memory? Right? Is it a thing? I don't know, it's not a thing, please. Your muscles don't have no memory. They're not zero. There's no memory in your muscles whatsoever. That's not how it works. But it means something. It means that uh, your body remembers how to do something. And that is, that, is, that is actually what it is. But nerve memory doesn't sound very good. Or 
short loop uh, 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 brainstem based signal generation, avoiding the, uh, <coughs> the, the, the premotor cortex so the muscle remembers how to do thumb something. It just doesn't sound very good. So muscle memory seems to work. Okay? So, um, let's see, where do I skip there? Nothing. Okay. When your brain learns stuff, when your body learns how to do something, the physical process of learning, this is really what we're getting into, this is the crux of this physical process of learning. When your body goes through this process of figuring out how to do something, it takes a long time. It's like lifting weights, right? You lift weights and you don't get out of the gym feeling stronger, you get out of the gym feeling weaker. And then you get some nutrition in you, you get some sleep in you, and uh, you can get sleep in you, but you get nutrition in you and you sleep. And you do that for a few days, and your body, having been torn apart, grows back stronger. Muscles so get bigger, right? So the six packs, right? So you your shirt off, looks good. Right? So um, that happens over time. It doesn't happen like right away. The physical part of learning is exactly the same thing. You ever figured out something like for a second, like you had it at the end of one day, it's like that was the best turns I ever had. You showed up the next day, or three days later, you cannot remember how to do what you did. It, like it was gone. It, it wasn't really gone because it wasn't really ever there. It was there for a second, but it hadn't become part of you yet. Once it's there, though, it's not very easily undone. In fact, it's actually permanent. Once you learn something, this is really important. Once you learn something, you have it forever. Okay. If you've watched your various trainers ski or snowboard and just noticed that they have different styles, no matter how good they get, they'll probably look about like that. Some version of that. Because it's really hard to change your personal style. I look a lot like me. I was skiing with Harry on the first day, and I hadn't skied, I hadn't skied in three months. And I was like, geez, I got to ski with people. I'm tired, slightly hungover, um, super jet lagged. I was like, Harry, what does it look like? Well, it looks like you skiing down the hill, just maybe a little slower. I'm like, okay, cool. Because it, it's. It's me, it's part of me, it's who I am, it's how it's, and I, I don't just do that out of choice, I do that because my body has grown to ski that way. Josh does weird crap with his left arm on every right, on every left footed turn. As long as I've known, he's one of the best skiers I've ever met. He still does this weird thing, doesn't even go anywhere. But right, he just keeps, he keeps doing that. Just keeps inching me around, <laughs> rotating me a bit more. It actually doesn't do that. You, 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 you got rid of, if you don't mind me sharing, you got rid of the negative attributes of that, but the thing is still there because it's you. Your body does that movement, right? Um, Garrett has his own things. Dean has his own things. Uh, MC has her things. JF has his things. Takao has his things. No matter how good they get, they still keep some of those things because your body has grown that ability as opposed to just chosen from that. So, yeah, this is called skill permanence. Once you have it, once you hit that autonomous phase, you're stuck with it. You have that for the rest of your life. Sorry. So all the crap you guys do right now that isn't good, that you don't like, learn to love it because you own it forever. <laughs> and that's really depressing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but here's why. Here's what happens. When you um, uh, learn a, when you, the way you learn a skill is your body respond, receives an, in, 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 an input from something. And your brain interprets that input and tells you to do something to respond to that. And by responding to it over and over again, you become accustomed to that. Okay, think about it like this. Um, you watch, well, let's watch a beginner ski in your mind for a second, or snowboard, right? They stand on, the, they stand on their planks. I'm going to be a skier for a second just because, right? Standing on my planks. I, Click in, even if I push the skis, push myself, or somebody else pushes me, what happens is the skis slide and the beginner flops around and falls over, right? They do that a few times. What happens is the skis slid. It took a long time for that signal to get to the brain. The brain to process it and to say, go at the same speed as your skis, go for it, or you're bored, whatever it is, right? It took a long time to get there. Now, after four or five times, they maybe slid with the skis forward because signals started to go, one, a little slower, a little faster, sorry, and two, the brain started to deliver, to develop a response for that. Uh, here's an example of how long it takes for that 
signal to get from your feet to your head, your head to process it, and to spit it back out. You ever walked into something like in the couch in the middle of the night, smashed your toe against it, and said, oh, shit, that's going to hurt. And then you're standing there for a second, that's totally going to hurt. That's totally going to hurt. That's, oh, wow, that really hurts. That's how long that actually takes. Okay? Another example would be, um, you ever watch somebody put their, uh, have you ever seen a child touch a hot pan? Who's never touched a hot pan before? And they don't immediately remove it? They leave it there for a second and become burnt. If, if somebody doesn't pull it away. Because it takes that long for that to happen. No. You learn that pretty quickly. And you touch the pan and it's like, oh, that's going to be hot. Okay, pull that away. Right? So that's how long that stuff takes. However, and that's because these signals, we're talking about electrical signals. This is a neuron, by the way. These electrical signals traveling down fleshy nerves go slow. And they get dissipated. What happens over time is the signal gets faster. Should we talk about why in a second? The signal gets faster, and you develop an automatic response. Example being, if you touch a hot pan now as an adult, the amount of times you've done that, you notice the sign you quickly pull your hand away, or and you don't get burnt. If you ever worked in a kitchen, or you were a chef, you do that even faster. For example, I was in a, I was a I was a chef much younger in life. And I had burnt my hand on a flat iron griddle more times than I can count. And my response time for pulling away from a, from a, from a hot, hot surface is really, really fast because of the number of times it's gone wrong. Okay? So, here's what happens in the or in any kind of motor skill. You do something once, twice, three, four, five times. Your brain starts saying, oh, I'm going to do this movement over and over again. So what I'm going to do is make the signal go faster. And how I do that is to create insulation. Your body, your neurological system, is basically a set of wires that's your computer system, which is your brain, wires that go through your body, that attach to muscles, or muscle spindles that actually pull and contract the muscle. Right? The spindle fires inside of it, sends electrical signals, and the muscle fibers pull back and things flex, things move, things turn, things hit. And rotate because of that. Okay. Um, think of uh, um, wiring in your house, right? Wiring in your house. If you had, uh, if you have, if there was in this lighting here, for example, if you pull the wiring out from this lighting, it has a little bit. Of, it's copper wire usually, right? With uh, with some plastic or rubber insulation around it. These lights wouldn't work very well if there was no insulation on them, because the signal wouldn't get all the way from one light to the next. It would. Dissipate. I'm not an electrician, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. Or the place burned down, one or the other, right? But it wouldn't, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work, because you have to insulate it. Now think about the cables. That's only a little bit of electricity coming through, right? Now think of the cables that are coming into this building from the power grid. They're bigger, they send more power to them. And what, what, what's the insulation look like on those cables? It's a lot thicker, right? Now think of the ones that bring power from whatever source Wanaka gets its power from. It's probably the hydroelectric system or something like that, right? Think what um what the cables that come in here, how big are those? Bigger yet, how big is the insulation? They, they get pretty big, right? That's the more power that needs to go through there, the more often the power is being sent through there, the more insulation you have to have for the system to work efficiently. It's not perfect simile, but it's pretty close. Your brain, your body works the same way. When you start doing something over and over again, your brain says, I need to build that faster. I don't want to work as hard. By the way, this is the associative process right here. We're in the associative process, we're talking about this. Your brain says, I don't want to work as hard to do this. I want to think this hard to do this. Because thinking takes up a lot of energy, and I want to do something else in my time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to coat the nerve with this kind of pellets of white fatty material, which is called myelin. That stuff wraps, basically, around the nerve, and it gets this thick, fatty coating on it. Myelin is essentially fat. Right? And it, it sent, makes it so the, the cable is insulated, the nerve is insulated, the signal doesn't dissipate, and then more of the signal gets there faster. That's how that works. When it's all coated and thick and firm on there, basically, that skill is somewhere in the autonomous phase, because it's moving quickly. There's something else that happens there, too. But 
The associative process is wrapping the cable, wrapping the nerve with myelin so that it can happen quickly and you can focus on other stuff. Make sense? All right. The thing about myelin, which is both awesome and terrible, is it only wraps one way. It doesn't unwrap. Barring neurological diseases or injury or new pathways need to be formed, it doesn't go anywhere. Like when you get old, older, it doesn't go away. It just it's there, right? It's um you ever heard the phrase just like riding a bike for something that you are, haven't done in a long time and are about to do? It turns out that's true. Right? If you learned to ride a bike when you're a kid, maybe not know how to ride a bike. If you learn to ride a bike when you're a kid and you haven't done it for 20 years, you're not going to be as good at it as you were when you were a kid for a whole lot of psychological reasons. But you're not going to have to relearn how to do that. You just have to practice a little bit and it comes back. It goes back quickly. Um, if you hadn't skied since March and you showed up here, you'd have to relearn how to ski. You just had to ski for a bit. You know, within a few days, you're skiing like you again because all of that stuff is myelinated. It's there. Okay. Now, what, here's another thing that happens. We talked about, let's talk about a loop here. This is an input-output loop. Just made that up. Pick up something next time. Next year when you all hear me do this again. Okay. So, basically, ski field, you feel something. In this case, the ski isn't on the ground, maybe. You notice the ski isn't on the ground. This long loop goes back, brain says ski isn't on the ground, what do I got to do? I got to get the ski on the ground, maybe I should tilt the body that way a little more and the ski will go onto the ground. Okay? And this long loop happens today. It's a really long process. That's foot, to head, all in the head, back to the foot, make the body be something. Well, <clears throat> this guy's the same guy we saw winning race. His loop doesn't go like that. His loop is really short. Because we'll probably want to go to the spinal cord or somewhere below the brain. The conscious brain doesn't get involved in this. There's no real problem solving. He's felt the movement a million times and immediately adjusts, which is why he wins by just over a second. So not only do we have this thick myelin that is coating the nerves and never goes away, but the process is no longer really happening in the conscious part of the brain. It's happening somewhere else. So you know, the stuff you truly own, you don't even know what you're doing. You're just doing it. Okay. So, this requires an absolute shitload of time to do. <laughs> it can't be undone. So if you want to learn something, you want to learn, you're not going to own it in a week. You're not going to own it in an hour. You can get cognitive and very, very quickly. The associative process, as we just talked about, took, will take a very, very long time. And then once it's there and autonomous, it's it's just there. Correct. I'm sorry. We do have some hope for it. Let's try something real quick. Um, or we go like this. Okay. Uh, look down and tell me which thumb is on top. Okay. Doesn't matter. The memory's gonna be different. Do it again. Same thumb on top. Yes. Yeah, if you do this a hundred times, the same thumb will be on top every time. Put the other one on top. Flip it around. How weird does that feel? Yeah. Right? And flip all the fingers, not just one. So like, if you went, see, you're flipping, I don't know your name, sorry. When you, have, you, you flip one, go this and do, clasp your hands entirely the other way. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to take you a second to figure that one out. It feels like you're holding someone else's yeah. hand. Right? It's weird, right? Yeah. Okay, this is an example of moving to a cognitive process. We had to actually figure out how to put the hands together that way because the amount of times we went that way. It's a cognitive process. You do it long enough, you do it enough times, it will become associative and then it will become autonomous. Here's the cool thing then you'll have two autonomous ones. This will feel the same as that will. I've done this presentation enough times that it actually doesn't feel that abnormal now. But then you have two things to do, and two things to do is a hell of a lot better than one thing to do. Keep that in mind. Let's go to learning that. So we can, we can define learning as something as this. Um, let's do this. A permanent or near permanent change in understanding behavior. That's what learning is. And this is why learning is that. It's a near permanent, permanent change in behavior. 
not because of a choice, but because your body grows the skill, and once it's grown, it's there. It's like if you grew on your head, you just have that there, right? It's there. Um, for any other uh, uh, Star Wars aficionados uh, like myself, we have to apologize to Yoda. He's wrong. You cannot unlearn what you have learned, which is what he says you must do. You can't do that. So here's the problem, or the, the positive side. Change, you can't change something you're doing. You can't unlearn it. You can't say, I don't want to do that thing with my right hand, Josh, my right elbow, Josh. I don't want to do that anymore. You're going to be able to do that. I don't want to, don't want to I can't. Uh, unlearn how to do that. I can't unlearn how to be too far forward on my left foot on every damn turn. I can't unlearn that one. I, I, I am. I always have been. I will always be able to do that. But what I can do, and you can do, is choose to learn a new thing. So then you have two, right? If you do this enough times, you'll have two ways of doing that, and they will, neither one will feel weird. They'll both feel just fine. Okay? So we can choose to do something different and go through the childlike process, remember that as well, the childlike process of learning something from, from scratch, becoming cognitive in it, so we understand what the output is, and, and we don't know how to do it, becoming associated with it where we experiment with inputs and outputs, and get to a place where it's like, okay, I can kind of do this, so I'm thinking about it, and then have it be fully myelinated through that process to be that other thing that we own, and now I can do this, and I can do that. Some of the, the absolute favorite uh, uh, skiers, um, uh, uh, Michael Rogan is one. He's on that kind of demo team. You know, he's there are better skiers, better high. You can't publish this, by the way. Um, there are better high performance skiers. There are better low performance skiers. Maybe there are people who, who are faster in a racehorse. He's a very, very good skier. But one thing he can do better than almost anybody I've ever met is he can imitate everybody else's skiing <laughs> <laughs> because he has hardwired. So many darn movement patterns into him that he can just turn them on over and over. He's like the best like, weird body part demonstrator I have ever seen because he has tried everything and learned everything and experimented with everything. And I encourage you guys to do that too. There's no one way to do anything, by the way. There's a lot of ways to do stuff. And the more ways you can do it, the better you get. That's a different lunch. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so <laughs> as you're here, this is a mindset that's pretty important. You are not here to change your skiing or riding. If you thought that's what you were here for, please abandon that right now because you can't. What you are here to do is learn new things that will enhance your skiing and riding so you will have more skills. Everything you do is already you're really good at. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing. Everything you do, you're really good at. The problem is everything you do that you're really good at gets in the way of learning new stuff. I said this thing about childlike learning. Um, kids learn faster than adults. Why? What's that? Could be. There's there's not a lot of evidence for that though. There's it's a good excuse for older people. It's a really good excuse for people like us who are older and just like I don't really want to learn that. I'm not a kid. Must be something to do with neuroplasticity. Your, your uh, elasticity of your mind, or it's called neuroplasticity. You can say that again. Elasticity of the, of the mind, like the fact that it's not that it's actually stretchy, it's more gooey than it is stretchy, right? But it's um, um, uh, it's uh, it, it's called neuroplasticity. Plastic meaning something temporary. Your brain is the most plastic organ in your body. It rewrites itself all the time. You can add, or you can rewrite, adds new things all the time. So, yeah, sure, there's a little more plasticity in kids at different stages. There's some evidence on that one. But as a whole, you re retain a ton of plasticity your entire life. So why else? It's not a physical thing. Less, less stuff, stuff in your head to them. It's a, what's the okay. Less stuff in your head. Less stuff in your head, yeah. I'll go with that. There you go. It is that they don't have any preconceptions. They enter everything with total curiosity because they're like, well, I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how to do anything like that. I've never seen that before. I'm going to go figure that out. And they totally month themselves most of the time trying to figure it out. But it's this, the curiosity overpowers the will to, uh, for help sometimes, right? And that's, that's something for us. We already have ways to do things that prevent us from trying to do the hard work of other things. Because, yeah, I just described the associate process. That physically sucks. It's tiring. I described the cognitive process. That's emotionally devastating. 
to sit there saying, I think I know how to do something, is, oh, I don't know how to do that at all, but I know what I can't do. That's a terrible emotional process to go through. Then you have to go through the physical process, and then you got to own it for the rest of your life. Jesus, that's, that's, like, that's pretty, that, that's a commitment. That's the rest of your life kind of commitment. Uh, kids don't think of it that way. Okay? They don't have those problems. So, somebody's going to say something. Yeah, go for it. So, kids have done his skip the associative stage, you know, from cognitive to just try nothing to associate with, so just jump into the autonomous? No, no, ab absolutely, no absolutely not. The, no? no. What I'm saying is kids don't have um, uh, blocks, typically, from the perspective of the... Um, okay, Eugene, here's, let's look at it this way. Somebody who has never skied before has nothing in their way of learning to ski differently. We all already know how to ski. So we have our current understanding that stops us from trying something new. It would take harder to try something new. It doesn't, it doesn't have to. This is my point. It doesn't have to. It just, there's blocks in there. Okay, here's one of the things that, that goes back to, let's go back to um, uh, Marcel Hersher, for example. That guy skis incredibly well because he didn't really ever learn any bad habits. Not that I've ever seen in his game. He never, everything he did was very deliberate and very, Michelle Schiff is the same way. She's, everything she's learned has really great habits to it. Sean White on snowboard is the same way. Everything he learned was deliberate. It was purposeful. There was a reason for it. These are complete freaks of nature who did everything by very focus. Most of us went out and played around and figured out how to do something and say, hey, I can do that now. Right? Now we don't. The problem is we can do that and it stops us from doing something else. Okay, here's an example. Everyone in this room already skis and rides or rides really, really well. Can everybody get down Main Street comfortably? Then you're already advanced in your sport. Really advanced in your sport. There's no reason, like from a physical perspective, a mental perspective, an emotional perspective, there's no reason to actually get any better. Because you can do that. In fact, you're going to default to, Eugene, to this question, you're going to default to the path of least resistance, the easiest path, which is, I'm going to do what I'm doing right now and try to make that a little better, instead of what I'm doing is fundamentally different from the thing that I want to do, so I have to start from the beginning. That is harder work. So, the things we know, as you said, what's your name, Dave? Dave, what Dave, Dave said, the things you know kind of get in the way of the things you want to learn because they, they're in conflict. Okay? All right, so, here's the path to actually getting to a new development. This should probably be skill and not understanding. But, um, as a student, starts with something, and they have this thing they want to get to, provided they have a whole bunch of other things about regardless. They, they, here's where they start, here's where they want to end. What they kind of have to go through is a bunch of conflict and confusion. Essentially, you have things you know, and those are, this is a super simple way of looking at this, it's overly simplistic, things you know are not confusing, because you understand them already. Things you know how to do are not confusing because you already know how to do them. There's no conflict there. There's no kind of money there. Okay? Things, everything else that you already don't know or you don't know how to do is going to be somewhat confusing. It could be really confusing. It might be a little confusing. But there's going to be a moment of, I don't quite know how to do that. That's confusion. It doesn't have to be frustration, but it has to be some, I don't quite know how to do that. Have to figure that out. And what learning really is to create that permanence is the resolution of that confusion. So you come out on the other end saying, oh, now I understand that and I know how to do it. It's a process that no trainer can do for you. You have to do, as my group will tell you, you have to do it for yourself. You have to figure out how to resolve the confusion of how this stuff works. Okay? How a child goes through this is they go jump into the swamp of confusion, they jump in the pit of despair for a second. But with no preconceived notions, they just play with it and they figure it out until they come out the other end with the with, with an understanding. How most adults tend to go through this, at least to start with, is they jump in with all of their baggage, all of their knowledge, everything they can already do, 
and it gets in the way of them trying to learn the new thing because they're trying to assimilate it with the old stuff. And that not only has confusion, that has conflict. It's like, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to learn how to do this, but I used to be told how to do that. Okay? Well, yeah, sure, you might you used to be able to, don't try to put it together, just do this one. Don't worry about that one. That's not right or wrong. It's not, that's not the point. This is different than that. Don't try to put them together. Okay? So if we jump into the swamp of confusion with all of our emotional and knowledge baggage and try to pull it all together at the same time, we're going to create conflict, we're going to create frustration, and we're going to slow learning down like nobody's business, and you may never get to this point. Or you have the choice of learning like a kid does. You jump in saying, I want that. I have to pass through this. The fastest way to pass through this is ignore what I already know, ignore what I've heard in the past, and just learn the new thing. Because <coughs> here's the pure logic on that. If you just learn the new thing and own it, so you own it as well as you owned the thing you had before, you'll be able to choose, you'll understand it really well, and you'll be able to choose which one's right, which one's wrong, and how do they work together. If you sit there trying to mesh this shit together, you probably won't really ever understand anything. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? To ski and learn to snowboard. Yes, or snowboard learning to ski, or anybody learning to ski or snowboard. What are some of the techniques you use um, to actually <coughs> just throw that stuff out? As a, before, now, that is a great question. The question is, what are some of the techniques I use to throw that stuff out? Well, not you just put it aside. Put it aside, yeah. Okay. As a coach or as a student, as a learner? Well, as a coach, you're going to help your students with techniques. That Th physical to violence them. works well as a coach. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, yeah. So I mean, you get your message across. You'll have to Let's go with that as a learner. That's probably a better one. Yeah. It's a ton of mental discipline. Right? The, the key that kids have, you got to look at Let's look at the example, right, of, of where this happens really well. It happens really well with children. Not all children, but provided no learning disabilities or other stuff, right? And it can happen well with all children. This is what happens when we get kids who are challenged to learn, to learn. The desire to learn stems from genuine confusion. Not sorry, gen genuine, genuine curiosity. Sorry, that, that's what I was looking at. That was the word. I'm sorry, it's awesome. Genuine curiosity. And that's got to be curious not about how does this relate to the thing I already know, but what is the new thing? It's discipline to just jump in and be like, hey, I got three hours with this dude in front of me or this lady in front of me, and I'm, I'm going to, he or she is trying to get me to do something that's totally new to me. I'm not going to judge it. Judgment, ju ju uh, uh, judgment is the enemy of this. I, I'm not going to judge it. I'm just going to try it. I'm going to try it. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to be reflective. I'm just going to go through the process until I until I get it, and I can judge it later. Yeah, it's about being present. Totally, 100. That's a great word. 100 percent present in this new thing, and not whether you like it or don't like it, because if you don't know how to do it. I'm sorry, you're not qualified to judge whether you like it or whether you don't like it. You've got to get good at it first, and then you can decide whether you like it or whether you don't like it. But if you get good at everything you learn here, you're going to have a huge knowledge base, huge skill set base, and you'll be able to pick and choose all kinds of stuff and develop your own thing. Which is really the goal. It's not to be able to ski or ride like any other person. It's to be able to ski or ride like you. Skiing and riding is an art as much as a technique. It's about expression. But like anybody who went there, you have to art school here. I went to music school, a crappy painter and drawer, but we had to learn every style of music. There's some I like more than others, but we had to learn everything you could so that you could become your own, you could pick and choose from something. Okay. But that's that's the primary technique I use. It's about presence. And I mean, people who ski with me regularly will tell you how many times am I saying, don't worry about that thing you heard in the past. It doesn't matter. Leave it alone. Here's, this is what you're doing now. Right? It doesn't have to mesh. I often hear people saying, but this conflicts with this thing I've been told before in my mind. I'm like, no, it's, it's, the, it's the same thing. It's just a different angle to get there. It doesn't conflict at all. But I, I can't explain that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you have to learn that. Or that person has to learn that. And the way they learn it is by ditching the old thing, learn the new thing, then they can put it together on their own. That's how I do it as a coach.
much. That and physical violence. Yeah. Right. Bribery doesn't work, but punishment seems to. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, embracing this piece here, and confusion isn't a bad thing. It's just it's, I'm just I just use the term for kind of shock value. It's really just exploring the thing. You can put curiosity in there too, but it's curiosity about something you don't understand and accepting that the process you're going to go through is one of resolving the things you don't understand. And another one would be this. Um, uh, assuming the thing I'm being told, your original question, what's some of the stuff that gets in the way of the learner, um, uh, would be, or uh, this is not such a tactic of how to um, uh, how to action that, but it's one of the blocks that can get in the way. If we assume what we're being told, we do understand. Which is pretty often. Right? Communication is that uh, effective communication, I said something or showed you something, and you received and understood what I said and showed you in the way I, I meant it, and then I verified by you bringing it back to me in some manner. It's quite often that I put something out there as a coach. Person comes back, oh yeah, I understand that. See, look, it's like, oh, that's, that's, that's not what I was talking about at all, right? That's either on me or it's on the other person, but really, communication will both be. So, um, my job as a coach at that point is to find a different way to communicate it. Your job as a learner, we never speak English, I'm not saying it's you, but we, my, your job as a learner is to um, not assume that you know what I'm talking about <laughs> and dig in with, I probably don't understand that. Let me embrace that like a child and jump right in head first. Let's figure it out because I'm excited to, figure, to get to the other end of that. There's another question then. Um, visual feeling or hearing, like right? different okay. you know, methods yeah, of yeah, communication. Yeah. Um, how do you, from your experience, which seems to be the majority way that people learn? Yes. All three? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you have a whiteboard? We don't. We don't. Okay. Um, so VAK, let's, let's put it into um, VAK or communication methods. The learning styles are a little different than that. They stem from them. So there's a bunch of different models for that, but let's look at the one that the, the grandfather to all learning styles models, and it's Coles. And we can, we can make some really simple language from that. So a learning style this isn't the same as teaching styles, like guided experience, discovery based, what the problems are, it's different. This is learning styles, like how do people learn? Like, watcher, feeler, doer, thinker. You ever heard about that? People who learn by thinking about stuff, people who learn by watching stuff, people who learn by feeling stuff. Right? Okay. Those in the Colesian model are not steps, are not, are not things that people live in. It's a cycle people go through. So, learning, people aren't watchers or feelers or doers or thinkers. Yeah. Right? This, they're not that. They're not those. Not one of those. Or they're not two of them. They are watching, feeling, doing, thinking learners. <laughs> that, that's how people learn. And in this, in the way that model was actually designed. This is, sorry, yet a different picture. We'll get into it. The way that model was designed is designed to pick the starting point that you and I are going to have the best place for. Like if you're watching me ski all the time and like picking stuff up, I'm going to show you something. And I'm going to use that to get you to think about it. And then I'm going to use that to talk to you about it, right? And have a more auditory, right? And then I'm going to get you to feel some, right? You see what I'm saying? But I, it's about moving between different modalities. And that's how we anchor a learning. And that really gets us deep into the associative process where the myelination happens. So which one is it? Yes, it's all. All those communication styles are required, provided it's not everybody has these. You should have to provide your audience has those senses. And all of those learning styles are required regardless of senses. Because watchers really can be an internal visualization as well. Okay. The key is changing between them. <clears throat> Nothing to say there. Very good. Okay, a few takeaways. We're going to be done by eight, which is about six minutes away. Okay. We've covered a lot of ground on this. Great questions. Do you have any other questions, by the way? Anything else? Is learning infinite? Does it just go on forever? That's up to you. Yeah. 
as in there's no physical limitation. Okay. That's up to you. Yeah. Oh, I think limitations are what we put on ourselves. That's what we know so little about the brain and what the capacities are. It's more powerful than any computer we've created so far. So I would say that it's um, it's unlimited. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't slow down the page necessarily. Uh, I there's different studies that say it does and say it doesn't, but I think from a physical perspective, what we're finding is it doesn't slow down nearly as much as we think it does. It's more fatigue, emotional distress, the desire for learning, that's the stuff that slows down. I mean, look at look at somebody like Bill Gates who every year for a week, I mean that guy has something to do every two years of his life, it's world changing. I think he's late sixties now. And he's showing no sign of slowing down because he is hardwired to be curious about everything on the planet. And he learns everything like a kid. He goes with no preconception, he just says. <laughs> That's like a stool hug. So I think the infinite, the infinite idea of learning is absolutely a personal choice. I think what stops people is the discomfort that you get in learning because there is that discomfort. So most most times your ego just says, you know, I'm, I'm at this level and why go any further? And if you can get past your ego to say, okay, it's try something different. This is another piece and from the emotional perspective yeah. for kids, they don't they don't develop strong yeah. egos until yeah. later in my year. That's, that's developed through, through peers. Okay. That's true. Yeah. Okay. So learning process is both mental and physical. We talk about the mental part of the stages, how that works. We talk about how the body is physically going through stuff in those stages. The key stages are uh, for the physical part is the associative phase where you're myelinating things, you're actually growing the skill, and then the autonomous phase is where you're you're uh, in there. It gets it's basically becoming a different part of you. Right? It's not it's not coming right up in here. Okay. Working to discover solutions to problems in front of you. With true curiosity, not trying to over-understand it or judge it too quickly, but just trying to own it so that you can decide later if you like it, if it works, and how it affects your overall understanding is key. Giving yourself the time to do that. Okay. Recognizing the stage of learning that you're in, because these processes take a while. A cognitive process doesn't take that long. It really doesn't. You're just trying to figure out what am I currently doing, and how is it different from the thing that I want to do? So what you're trying to do, that does not take long. You can do that tomorrow morning by 11 o'clock for the whole week. Then you can take a week to go to the hard parts, because that associated process is going to take a while, a long time. Giving yourself the time to grow the skills. Yeah. Giving yourself the nerve, the sleep, right? The right the right supplements, the right mental state of mind, the peace to, to go through that, and actually let your body go through the recovery from the training that you're going through. This is why we train two days, a day off, and then two days on, typically, when, when they're provided, right? It's so that you can train hard for two days, not get overloaded, but get actual stuff. You have a day to find your own sense of peace, whether that's get up on the hill and ride, or whether that's do something else, go out and get blasted in the bar, whatever it is that gives you your mental peace and day off, and then you go for two more days, and then you have two days off. Because you don't need to train more than that. You need that much time. You don't go to the gym seven days a week, six hours a day. You go a few days, a day off, a few days, a day off. Okay. <laughs> I just love this quote from Dr. Seuss. It's better to know how to learn to know. That's what we're here for. You know what you know, and it's good. You worked hard for it, and you're good at it. Now, we're here to learn new stuff. So the best thing you can do is know how to learn and improve your parents. Any other questions in the last 45 seconds? That we have? <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs>